thanks for coming out. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a roller coaster ride, not like one of my normal talks. My normal talks, I have maybe 60 slides. Let me try to go one slide a minute. Uh, but I have 200 <laughs> or so slides tonight. So uh, I'm going to be going pretty quick, all right, especially at some points. Now, uh, having said that, it's, there's a lot of visual images here, old pictures of the lake. What we plan on doing is taking this material, including, you know, stuff that you folks would have as well, and creating a Facebook page and showing all this stuff so you can look at it to your heart's content. Um, you're going to think, oh, man, uh, why doesn't he slow down? Well, we'll be here till 12 o'clock if, if I don't speed up. Okay. Um, but thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to thank Bill Dunbar, John Gloria Zingas, um, Frank Alden, Annette Framoslowski, Paul Goldman, Buck Coliani, and Dick Co Cochran for all the help that they have given me for this talk. I want to thank EKG Downtown for some technical support and uh, the pictures that you saw uh, before coming in. Um, Noah and Tammy White, drone photos. They're fantastic. Hopefully we'll get some of those on the site as well. In the late 1930s, beset by a scandal in his administration, Marlboro Mayor Ingalls came to the reservoir on a winter night, cut a hole in the ice near the present boathouse, and jumped in. His body was found the next day. Part of the history of the reservoir is the relatively small number of people who have lost their lives here. We take a moment of silence now to remember them. The Indians. It all started with the Indians. From the time that the uh, English came, there were three distinct periods that we understand. Before that, it's like the prehistory of the Indians. We don't know that much about it. But in the first period in Marlboro, there was Whipsup Nicky, the original Indian village. That lasted until 16, about 1620. There was a terrible plague here. Okay, and from then until 1654, you had empty land. There was nobody really, there was no village here. There might have been Indians passing through, but it was pretty much empty land. And then in 1654, the praying Indians were installed here by Apostle Eliot, the great missionary to the Indians. And they stayed here until 1675 when King Philip's War broke out, and then uh, the land uh, wound up going slowly but surely to the residents of Marlboro. So, before the plague, there was Whipsup Nicky. There had been a tribe, they were, they were understood to be Wamasit by tradition. Uh, the Wamasits were uh, primarily settled up near Tewksbury, uh, Route 38, 495. Uh, there's an Indian statue there that was the Wamasit, uh, the primary Wamasit location. But they also came down uh, as part of the, uh, the Merrimack water system. They came down as far as the Assabet and into Marlboro. John Bigelow, the uh, engineer for the city of Marlboro in the 60s, was a uh, great... Um, historian of the 20th century, he said that the Indian settlement of Whipsup Nicky was at the top of the hill on or near Hosmer Street. The settlement there was mostly destroyed by the Great Plague that came around 1617. So they were pretty much wiped out. The Indians of the colonial period called it Whipsup Nicky, which could be translated place abandoned because of disaster or pestilence. And the English called it Whip suffrage. All right. So, on the earliest, in the earliest discussion of the Sudbury residents coming to Marlboro, they talked about moving to whip suffrage. Okay. And um, as far as I know, in, in all the reading that I've done on early Indian life uh, in Massachusetts, 
It is the only place with a name associated with the plague. So it's kind of unique in that way. They didn't call themselves Whipsipniki. The Indians that came afterwards called it that. And uh, Bigelow said that uh, it was a place cursed. The Indians never went back there. All right. And it remained cursed, so much so that all the hills in Marlboro were named except Hosmer Street. Uh, it never got a name because it was cursed. So then after that was empty land. In this period, the land is abandoned. Uh, there may have been some Indian activity here. The Nipmucks probably came in and, you know, came through, camped here or whatever, but there were no, uh, there was no Indian village. I couldn't find any deed of Marlboro land sold to the English, uh, such as you had up in Lancaster. Uh, so it must have been considered empty land, both by the English and the Indians. Nobody claimed it. 1651, Apostle John Elliott establishes this first native town in Natick. So Natick was entirely Indian in, in its origin. Uh, after a while, they started to grow and grow. So a number of the Indians appealed to Elliott for more towns. Give us more towns. Well, you know, we're growing. Um, and so Okamikamisset was established in Marlboro around 1654. And the Natick Indians were a mixed group. They were just converts. They included the Wamasset, the Massachusetts, Nipmuc, Wampanoag, pretty much uh, a mixed bag of Indian tribes that lived in Massachusetts. Most probably the leadership in Marlboro, including Chief Onamog, were Wamasset. It's quite likely that uh, Onamog had survived the Great Plague because he was old enough. He probably survived the Great Plague. Um, it whips up Nicky and came back later to be the chief in Marlboro. Important Indian sites in Marlboro, the village area near the old Howe House, near the hospital, burial area, near the intersection of Union Street and Pro Prospect Street, the reburial site at the old common cemetery, and the fort. And the fort, of course, was down here. This was the extent of the uh, Indian land in Marlboro. So here you have the lake. It went all the way to Wood Square in Hudson, Highland Street, and Union Street in Marlboro. I mean, that's up here. So that's here's where the village was. It went all the way down to the Walker Building. All right. And then uh, to Bolton Street, all the way to the... Uh, the east uh, end uh, waste site, all right, where the uh, uh, down by uh, the way to that wayside country store down there, uh, and then north. So it was 6,000 acres, more or less. And their planting field was right here, right below their village. Here's what's the Nikki about, and here's where the fort was. Pequot Museum down by Foxwoods is the largest Indian museum in the world, and they, uh, they have some you know, great visual things. They were Algonquian too, so much of uh, what you see down there applied to the Indians around here. Um, you can see this is their teepee uh, that they made. It was a frame building. Um, the uh, Indians, the praying Indians, would not have dressed like this. So the idea that the English had was first you became English and then you became a Christian. That was their idea. Okay, so uh, they encouraged the converts to dress like the English, to act like the English, to work like the English. Um, so they would have been dressed far more uh, uh, modestly and, uh, you know, some of them would even be, from a distance, you would say that they were English. So here's their finished homes. The English came and they said that uh, 
those who stayed in these homes, they said that they were as comfortable as the English homes, um, even though of a completely different sort. Um, the English implements, uh, when they came, were highly prized by the Indians. Um, so um, knives and forks, pots and pans, uh, they loved them. And especially what they loved was the English weaponry, naturally. What they didn't, what the English didn't like about the Indians were that they were hunters and fishermen. The English thought that only the idle rich did hunting and fishing. That's what they did in England. So they thought that the Indians were lazy, okay? And they didn't understand this. this there was a cultural divide like you wouldn't believe. The Indians did a lot of fishing. This is the kind of boat they would have used, um, probably a little bit on the, um, the uh, brook, but certainly on the Assabet. Uh, the Assabet, um, John Bigelow said, was translated the place of nets. So they would have done a lot of fishing. And in, in so far as where the falls are at the narrows, uh, they would have done a lot of fishing there as well. This is the brook down at uh, Wayside Inn, and the Fort Meadow Brook would have looked very much like this in the period of the Indians and up until they um, dammed the brook. The women of the tribe would fish. That was their primary, I mean, not fish, they would uh, plant. So the planting field uh, would be theirs, and they would do uh, almost all of the farming. Now let's talk about the fort. The forts were used to protect harvest from winter and, and from enemy tribes. Uh, the Mohawks and Tarotines primarily were their, their big enemies. Some likelihood that the fort was rebuilt from the days of Wipsipniki. All right, um, I don't think that it's necessarily a coincidence that both Hosmer Street and uh, Bolton Street feed right down to uh, this area. Uh, was the fort of English origin? I can assure you that there's no possibility. The English had limited resources at that time. This was empty land. There was nothing here to protect. We know that when the English came in 1660, there was alway, already a place called Fort Meadow. And this was before the English built their first house. So the only fort they could have been talking about was the Indian fort. There was an English garrison near here, but it dates from after 1700, okay? So um, the name Fort Meadow comes from the Indian fort. So this is kind of what a fort might have looked like. Um, you see the vertical structures and the homes built within it. You see the Indians um, and the, the kind of structures, the, but the height. This all would have been about what you would have seen. John Bigelow's discovery. Passing by Red, Sp Red Spring on the South Shore, the Indians would come to a rocky waterfall at Fort Meadow Brook at what is now called the Narrows of the Reservoir. Crossing at the waterfall, one could continue across the meadow to the steep sand hills at the north side of the reservoir, and here they had their fort or storehouse for winter food supply. Food dried or smoked and placed in plated sacks to be buried in pits near in the sand. So where is that? Well, I believe that it was right along the flat area uh, between Bruce Road and uh, Daniels Road. Um, that's based on John Bigelow's um, little discovery. Um, maybe some of you have another opinion. Uh, I'd love to hear it. Um, but right now, this is what I get to work with. So here's the uh, buried grains. At the fort site in 1642, continues John, I found five, 42, 
19, no, 1942. He was an engineer in the 20th century, John was. Okay, so this is, this is 1942, before they started building houses. I found five stone fire platforms, each about six feet in diameter, and ranged along one center line so that they all could be contained within one long house. Alas, these fire platforms remains were in the midst of the home building development, uh, and they and other relics have been destroyed. Okay, but where did these five six foot diameter stone fire platforms go? Were they buried? Do they lie somewhere five feet underground after they moved the dirt around for the development? Were they taken out? We don't know. But if anybody finds them, please give me a call. Because <laughs> that would be the location of the longhouse. So Not the entire fort, but. I didn't think the uh, natives around here built longhouses. Um, yes, they did. Yeah. yeah, the Pequots, you'll see, um, show them as a, as, a, uh, as a feature. And they're, from all the reading that I've done, uh, long houses are mentioned numerous times. So this is the Pequot version right here. Um, these aren't nearly as, as uh, wide in diameter. These are only about three feet in diameter. So the ones that John saw were almost twice as large as this. There were five of them. So this house must have been very, very large. Okay. Uh, notice that the structure is pretty much the same as a regular home, but it's bigger. Uh, this one here was about 30 to 40 feet long. I imagine to fit five fire platforms, it would have been closer to 100 feet, maybe even bigger than that. Now, the Indians, from my perception, would have used this area as a summer encampment. Their homes, after all, were at the top of the hill. Okay, So this would have been sort of a summer encampment. There would have been uh, enough room for the children to play and for the, the women to, to uh, uh, do food preparation and whatever else needed to be done, chores. And uh, so who knows how big the fort itself was. It may have encompassed, you know, hundreds of feet of the neighborhood, maybe a hundred yards, maybe more. Who knows? But I believe it was on the flat. That's what I think that that would have been uh, the most defensible position if they had put it on the flat at the at the highest point. That's why I kind of think um, Bruce Road in that area. So here's the exterior. You can see the fire platform inside. It's just a bigger uh, Come on. All right, so why did the Indians leave Marlboro? On August 30th, 1675, Indians are ordered out of Marlboro for their own safety. This is in the first few months of King Philip's War. So they're told to leave Marlboro, gathering in Natick. In late October, all the Indians, including the Marlboro refugees now at Natick, are interred at Deer Island for their own safety. And then for their own safety, they are never allowed to return to Marlboro, and all of the land is eventually sold to residents of Marlboro. Part of the Fort Meadow property is sold to Thomas Martin, the larger part of Indian land, about 5,700 acres, was purchased by the town of Marlboro, but the deed was voided by colonial authorities in 1684, and it was the same defective deed that was accepted 32 years later under dubious circumstances. All right, so even the descendants of the same Marlboro uh, owners um, including Charles Hudson, believed that it was all a bit fraudulent. 
Okay, so that's basically what we have. Post-war sales of Indian land to Thomas Martin. Who is Thomas Martin? He's an Englishman, leaves London after the Great London Fire of 1666, arrived in Marlborough, and fights with local militia against the Indians in King Philip's War. After the war, he appeals with others to get a grant of Indian land from colonial authorities. He, they basically said, hey, you know, we lost so much, we suffered so much, you know, we had to leave Marlborough, on and on, and they weren't buying it. They weren't going to just give the land to them. So when that failed, he begins to negotiate with the Indians directly for a purchase. As part of the great how uh, treasure of uh, history that we have at the Historical Society, uh, we have copies of the deeds um, that were sold to Thomas Martin. One of 20 acres, one of 12 acres, three acres, eight acres, six acres, almost 50 acres, uh, almost entirely within the bounds of Union Street, Hudson Street, and Bolton Street. Okay, so that's where the Martin property was, the primary property, the stuff he first bought. So his daughter, Dorothy, marries into the Howe family. In the ensuing years, Martin and the Howe descendants purchased most of the former Indian property along Bolton Street to Wood Square and Hudson. So now they're buying all the way down the hill, all the way to Hudson, and a great deal of this, especially in the upper basin of the reservoir. Uh, like I said, the Howe family has a detailed listing. We find a high percentage of property transactions along the western sections of the reservoir associated with the Howe family. This is a picture uh, included in the deeds of a 1700s era uh, map that shows uh, Martin's holdings. And this is just before he died. So if you see here, so this would have been the corner of Highland Street and uh, Union Street. And this would have been Hudson Street, as where, it's here, where you see a turn here. Mm -hmm. This is Hudson, this is Bolton Street. This line is what they call the town line. It was actually the Indian line, 150 degrees latitude, okay? Uh, that went all the way to Wood Square. So, this was the 50 acres or so that he first purchased. And then they purchased all this, the rest of this, the other side of Bolton Street, um, and all the way down to the lake. Um, and that was just, that was just one, the first generation. M generations afterward, there would have been more from the Howe family. Okay, so where did the reservoir come from? And is it a reservoir? In 1903, this map was created uh, by the, or for the American Woolen Company. Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, most of these properties were the 1840s holdings, whoever owned it in, in the 1840s. And this was purchased by Amory Maynard, who was a shop guy, believe me. So we're going to be com keep coming back and referring to this, uh, this map because it's very useful. 1903. Reason for the document, Amory Maynard died in 1890. His son continued to run the business until it went bankrupt, 1898. Following year, it reopened as the American Woolen Company, and this document was probably created to clarify the water rights to Fort Meadow Reservoir. Description. According to a 1987 water quality report, Fort Meadow Reservoir is an area about 263 acres formed by the damming of Fort Meadow Brook in the mid-19th century, first by Amory Maynard for a sawmill and then enlarged by the city of Boston for use as a reservoir. The reservoir is fed by Fort Meadow Brook, Flag Brook, and Sheepfall Brook on the western side, by Red Spring on the south, and then run off from adjacent hills. The 1903 document lists uh, 
a total of 294.14 uh, acres flowed and 1406 acres not flowed. I wish I knew exactly what this flow meant, but I presume it has something to do with water. So they have a total of 308 acres. I don't know why the discrepancy, but there you go. The roads that crossed first the brook and later the lake appeared on the earliest detailed maps of Marlboro, and the causeways were first built by the city of Boston and improved to accommodate the automobile in the 20th century. The causeways were widened around 1990 to accommodate tra traffic to Intel. So here's one of the earlier photos. You can, you can pretty much tell. Now this is colorized. I, I find it interesting that they kind of colorized this in the photo. Here's another one. It shows a lot more um, trees and shrubbery. The fence is larger. This one is interesting in that there's no, almost no shrubbery on it. I got this from, uh, from yes, Bill. Thank you. Um, and uh, my question is, is this one of the earliest depictions um, that we have. It may be the oldest. Um, was it built right as soon as the causeway was built? You know, it was painted then. The Cunningham Farm, which is at the corner of um, Lakeshore Drive and Reservoir Street, uh, that barn and that house um, had, had been there for, for very, very long. Uh, so the question is, is this the oldest depiction we have of it? Maybe. This, this photo, I, I love it because down here it says, Sunset at Fort Meadow. <laughs> well, think about which way we're looking here. <laughs> it's obviously a colorized photo. I guess when you're colorizing the photo, you can put the sunset which, whichever direction you want. And this, of course, is Bolton Street looking back toward um, Frenchie's Beach, uh, the Bolton Street Tavern. On the 1835 map, only a few homes appear, one at the far side of Reservoir Street on the right, that's the Cunningham Farm we just saw, one near the Hudson's present-day Centennial Beach, and a few belonging to the Maynard family on Lower Hosmer. So here's that beach. So this Howe House that became the Cunningham House we see in the photos. Um, Mrs. Brigham lived over somewhere on Fort Meadow Drive in that area there. That house disappeared. Both these houses actually disappeared. Um, Amory Maynard's house appears on this map. Um, that was down to the right of the intersection of um, Hosmer and Causeway Street. Thank you. Uh, you see the mill here. The mill was located right in the parking lot of the beach. Okay. Um, and the other Maynard lived at the, uh, the Curtis house at the corner of uh, Stephen Street and Hosmer. Ephraim. Ephraim Maynard, thank you. Amory Maynard and the making of Fort Meadow Reservoir. In the 1660s, John Maynard operates the first Marlboro Grist Mill on Mill Street, uh, down by Maple Street. This is abandoned because, probably because of poor water flow. In 1700s, the Maynard family operates the grist mill on Fort Meadow Brook. The mill appears on a 1794 map of Marlboro. The mill was on present day Shea Road in Hudson. At some point in the late 18th century, a sawmill is added further back on the brook at the site of the beach parking lot. I, I was looking frantically for a picture or a drawing or a map of the um, the mill pond, how big was it? And 
I suddenly looked at this map and I said, well, there it is. Right there. Notice how different this picture of the reservoir looks. This is from 1853. Here's the sawmill right here. And the mill pond would have taken up a large part of the parking lot. OK? And there was no Memorial Beach then. The dam, see this hard line here? That was the dam. OK? And this, this thing here was there before the dam. The mill pond was there before the dam was. And it wasn't very much of anything. It was as big as the parking lot. It didn't need a very big um, pond for it. So here's the 1835 map, a blow up of this map. So again, you see how the things flowed in that area. The Lost Road to Rock Bottom. Or why did they put the spillway there? So let's bring this together now. There were three maps, 1803, 1835, and then a modern map. OK, so you'll notice that on this map, if you came down, here's Stephen Street, right? Hosmer Street comes down, and it takes a quarter right turn to the right. That's this quarter right turn right here. All right, as you get down to the bottom of the hill, you take, you, you kind of go right down Hosmer. You see the same thing here, it goes right, but it also goes straight. All right, so where is that? If you go straight here, you're in the water. Well, guess what? That's where it is. It's under water. Here's the spillway. Why did they put the spillway there? It's out of place. First time I looked at it from the water, I said, makes no sense. You know, they, they got to go over water to, 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 you know, do any maintenance or uh, changes. Why is it there? Well, here's the reason. Here's the 1903 map overlaid a Google map. Okay, so uh, here's housing down here. Here's the beach. Okay, and here's the road that now. Where's Rock Bottom? Anybody know? Yeah, well, you're cheating. Yeah, you should know that anyway, right? Exactly. It was at Gleasondale. Um, and Rock Bottom, why would you go to Rock Bottom? Well, it, there was mills there. First there was a sawmill there, and then after, I guess, uh, Maine had put them out of business, uh, they, built a, uh, they built a woolen mill there. It was one of the oldest woolen mills in the country, from what I understand. Uh, so the farmers would bring their wool down there uh, for processing. So Rock Bottom was a favorite spot to go. And that was one of the ways you, you could go from the east end of Marlboro. And this road went kind of back here. So here's the spillway. Well, that answers the question. It wasn't in the middle of nowhere. It was, the end, it was at the end of an access road. OK? They did have to reroute the road, which they did, by putting it between um, Amory Maynard's house, which is over here, and the sawmill, they went right through his property and rendered his property valueless. But he didn't care. He was in Maynard. He didn't care. He didn't care. So, but here's the road, the lost road to rock bottom. And here's how it would appear. And it, notice that it, it catches Causeway Street down by Lower Road in Hudson. So what are these houses? Well, I was curious about that. I said, maybe there's, you can see parts of the road still. 
So I went down to Lakeshore Drive in Hudson, and um, the um, commission there, I guess, part of the commission's work is they make these areas pretty. So this is the spillway stream, and they put in rocks down here and a little, uh, a little walkway. This goes to Centennial Beach in, in Hudson. So I said, okay, well, see what I can find. I crossed over. Here's the spillway um, going behind the house. And sure enough, here is the rock wall that would have been along the road to rock bottom. It's still there. And you can't see it here. Well, just a little bit you can see up here is the spillway. It lines up with the spillway. If you, you know, look right down the stream, you can see the spillway very clearly. All right, back to Amory Maynard. Apart from the mill, Amory Maynard is involved in construction, becomes acquainted with William Knight of the Saxonville, New England carpet mills, where Maynard builds a factory for Knight. The Massachusetts Historical Society, a very early, early regional reservoir, was created in 4748, along with Lake Whitehall in Hopkinton, by the city of Boston, which had been threatened with a lawsuit as a result of its 1846 diversion of water from Long Pond, now Lake Kachichuit, in Wayland and Natick, for the Boston water supply. The intent was to use the, res the reservoirs to build up a reserve supply of water during the wet season. Total cost to the city of Boston for the Fort Meadow Dam and reservoir was $43,170. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've seen all kinds of numbers associated with this purchase. 100,000, well, this is the number, 43,000, and that's for the building of the dam and the purchase, okay? So where did the money go? Let's try to make sense of that. William Knight ran three thriving carpet mills in Saxonville, which were suddenly rendered useless by the loss of water power from the Long Pond project. He was given 150,000. He was 150, the largest paid by the city of Boston. To a more minor extent, Amory Maynard's mill privilege on Fort Meadow Brook was affected as well. The city paid him 21,000 for land and water rights at both Fort Meadow and Lake Boone, where he also ordered, had water rights. So I'm going to tell you, this is the official story, but I'm going to tell you the story is much bigger and deeper than this. Amory Maynard was a shrewd man. And they said that the problem was in 1946. Well, in 1946, he was already buying up land and water rights in Maynard. So he knew something was going on, okay? This whole thing was, was, started, was not started in 1946. 1846, sorry. Um, plus, he had to buy up all this land that he didn't own. That map, that 1903 map, showed all the places that he bought before he sold it to Boston, all right? He acted as a broker for Boston. And the thought enters my mind, was he in charge of the whole scheme? <laughs> All right? Because he was already moved before he even started the process. So believe me, there's a lot more of that story to tell. Uh, the histories of Maine don't tell much. Um, but I'm sure that there's more to, more to be found. From their combined resources, Maynard and Knight built a woolen mill on the Assabet River named the Assabet Woolen Company in North Sudbury, also called Assabet Village. And its success led to the formation of a new town named in Amory Maynard's honor. In 1858, the city of Boston decided that it didn't require the reservoir in Marlboro, and Maynard bought it back for $8,000. <laughs> And he was broke at the time, so he, from his family it passed into ownership to the American Woolen Company. Who owns the land beneath Fort Meadow Reservoir? 
Well, nobody can own land below a body of, of water unless the body of water is man-made, which clearly this is. Uh, in the 1903 document, it shows that Amory Maynard purchased most of the water rights from members of the Howe family, probably before the sale to the city. Well, from what I know now, certainly before the sale of the city. All right, so uh, if you look, you can't really tell on this map, but all of these different plots of land, they almost all belong to the house, and whatever name wasn't how was probably somebody that their sister married. <laughs> all right, because this land was passed down in the Howe family for centuries. Total cost, city of Boston paid $43,000 to buy and build a reservoir. In the late 1850s, Boston abandoned the idea, um, probably because it, would have, it was having trouble pumping it back to Boston. They sold it an auction back to Amory Maynard, making the total cost of the city about $35,000. What value is that in today's currency? Probably a couple million, who knows, huh? Mm -hmm. um, thank you, city of Boston. Yeah. Right, thank you. More on the land below the water. Okay, so this was the state in uh, 1903. At, at that point, the American Woolen Company owned almost all of this. Curiously, the city of Boston still owned a little bit of it. I don't know why, but they did. 1960, water rights belonged to two entities. Charles Fletcher, who had purchased water rights all the way to Maynard and owned one-sixth of the water rights on the reservoir, and the American Woolen Mills owned five-sixths of the water, Marlboro water rights, just the Marlboro. Both sold their interest to the city of Marlboro for one dollar. Very nice of them. When Digital Equipment Corporation purchased the Woolen Mill and Maynard, they also purchased the remaining water rights that were located in Hudson. In 1889, 1989, Digital sells the Hudson water rights to the town of Hudson for one dollar. I found it curious that Digital owned land under the water. <laughs> All the land beneath the water is now owned by either Hudson or Marlboro. Okay, so around the lake in the 20th century. The Stanley Gypsies. Anybody know anything about Stanley Gypsies? Oh my goodness gracious, this is terrible. So. Here's Route 85, I mean, uh, yeah, Route 85, Bolton Street. And this is the land to the left. And this is land um, uh, Asavet, the Asavet School. Yeah, a lot of that property is up here. So this is the land we're talking about, I think. May 18th, 1907, Marlboro Enterprise, the William Stanley Band of Gypsies are camped at Fort Meadow within a short distance of Fitchburg Street. Well, that's the other side of the Asimut property. Think about that. As has been its custom for several years, the band has about 25 horses and wagons. They were horse traders. There were many bands of gypsies that made their rounds in this area between 1900 and 1940. Most were quickly run out of town. Okay, and they would go, they would go to Marlboro and they'd get kicked out of Marlboro. They would go to Hudson, they would go to Framingham. They were just going from town to town, wherever the path of least resistance. The Stanley Gypsies, however, developed a solid reputation for horse trading and were allowed to operate for many summers. March 30th, 1925, Bill Stanley, well-known gypsy, is dead was owner of land near Fort Meadow here where he traded and sold horses for 45 summers. His wife died a few months later. Um, one of my uh, brother-in-law's um, aunts who was descended from the Burke family uh, ran into some gyps gypsies in the 60s and they were actually from the Stanley family. And uh, you know, the, much of the history was from around here, so they were curious about it. And they told her that after the mother and father died, this area was considered to be cursed. 
so the Stanley family stopped coming. The, uh, the Stanleys are buried in uh, Forest Lawn Cemetery in Hudson. Over, also on, over on that side is the rock. Okay, so the idea is, you know, the kids paint it. They take pictures of it. All right, now we got all kinds of rocks over there that are being painted. Then you post to the Facebook page. Numerous pics and commentary and a large Facebook community. Bruce Casey did a presentation on the rock a few years ago for the Historical Society. It was very interesting. And here's the Facebook page, the same picture. So this is what you do. You, you paint it up. You take a picture. Um, you put it on the site. It may last for two hours. You know? This one there has been there for quite a while. Um, but, you know, it could be there for two hours. The Grove. So this is Bolton Street, all right? And this is the Grove. So here's the water line. And this is the Grove. Um, and in 1903, it was owned by the Catholic Church, formerly Freeman Howe, of course. Sometime near to the turn of the century, 20th century, Father Lowney of the Immaculate Conception Church, probably with family money, purchased the stretch of land beginning on the north or Hudson side of Bolton Street, extending to the east. Contained swimming area, trails, picnic area, also suitable for boating. Father Lowney donated the grove to the Immaculate Conception Parish for use as a picnic area, supposedly with the stipulation that it be kept for 100 years. And I believe that on the 100th anniversary, it was sold to the city of Marlboro. For many years, it was known as Father Lowney's Grove. Now, of course, it belongs to the city. Nice sign there. There's a canoe access, boat access there. Pet, it's great for the walking dogs. And um, some beautiful trails. Frenchies Beach. Okay, so where are we? Here's, here's Bolton Street. Here's Reservoir Street. And here's the area now occupied by the Bolton Street Tavern. And it says Lefebvre owns it, formerly Edward Smith. But Lefebvre owned it in, in 1903. It was owned by the, okay. In an online article in 2014 in the Wicked Local website, the life of Melina Millie Druin was retold. She had died at the age of 104 in Hudson and had been the owner of the Rec Lounge. Her mother was Marie Lefebvre. Okay, so that's why uh, Melina Millie Druin owned the property. It was from her family for at least back to 1903, who knows how much earlier. And because the family was French-Canadian, it became known as Frenchies. Family owned the Lakeview restaurant and a hot dog stand in 1942, allowed people to swim at the small beach which became known as Lakeview or Frenchies Beach. In the 60s, the restaurant was destroyed by fire and was rebuilt as the Rec Lounge. From 1977 to 88, it operated as Keepers 2. Sometime in the 90s to 2012, it operated as the Piccadilly Pub, one of 13 locations, and now operates as the Bolton Street Tavern. So here's the lake view. Um, got some old pics here. There's the hot dog stand taken from the beach side. Uh, this, I believe, is Frenchie's Beach. Uh, and here's the interior of the restaurant. Very modest little affair. Um, taken from Bolton Street. There's Millie, I believe. Now, I, do, I believe that this was the restaurant and not 
the rec lounge because I don't see any alcohol there. But maybe I'm just getting old. I don't know. Yeah. Keepers 2. Says up there, 77 to 88. Piccadilly. Bolton Street Tavern. And no swimming. Boo. Okay, now let's look at the older homes. Cunningham Farm. This is the where the Howe uh, house was located in uh, the 1835 map. Here's a beautiful picture taken from Addition Hill, I'm sure. Um, so here you can see the barn, the very large barn that sat in back. The, uh, from what we can tell, the barn sat on the near side of Lakeshore Drive. Lakeshore Drive at the time would have been kind of a driveway. There's another house back here, so that probably dates this photo. Um, and we have this, I think that this must be a, a boathouse, right? And there's electricity, so it can't be that old. Here's a picture of the Cunningham Farm from uh, the Lakeshore Drive side. So here's Lakeshore Drive right along here. Here's the barn. And you can see the fields and the stone walls. So this is taken up the hill, from up the hill somewhere. See the causeway, both causeways actually. And this is the 1939 overhead um, picture that the city took. Uh, so you can see the farm is very pronounced over here. Okay, the Hapgood house, or whatever happened to Amy Maynard's house. So this, I believe, was the location of Amy Maynard's house where um, Hosmer Street, which is this side, on the far side, and I was taken from Causeway Street, all right? And notice you had this gateway almost. I think this is all that's left of Amory Maynard's house. Okay. The house was further back than this, though. I believe it was considerably further back. But there was nothing between his house and the uh, sawmill. All right. There was no road or anything between. He would just walk across his yard. This is the Lewis Hapgood house, currently uh, owned and lived in by Frank Alden, who I've become very friendly with. Uh, we've shared a lot of war stories. So this is on Hosmer Street and has a storied history and a lot of mysteries, believe me. This is the house as it appears now. Uh, this is the barn that had burned down, and uh, this is all that's left of the barn. This is the back end of the house. Notice there were extensive uh, changes made to this house. This is at 7, 719 um, Hosmer Street. Right after Miles Standish, huh? Yes. Uh, there are two houses after Miles Standish and then this, this estate. There's another outhouse, actually. This is actually a house that you could live in. It has an enormous um, chimney there that, uh, that will heat the whole little house. This is the cellar, and this is what got me thinking. Who would build a house where the foundation sat down here, and you put some bricks in and put the house on top of the bricks? Who would do that? Okay, who would do that? So I looked at it and I said to myself, self, that house was moved. Okay, 
Um, now, I'm going to ask you, don't take my word for it, because I don't know anything about colonial houses. But I looked at that and I said, I certainly wouldn't have built a house like that. But here's the thing. Amory Maynard was a house builder. As much as he was a, a mill operator, he had 60 men in, under his employment making houses. Um, the industrialists of his age would put in a factory and then they would have nobody to work in the factory unless they built them houses, which he did. He built most of downtown Maynard, okay, for his workers. And before that, he was building factories for William Knight. He would have been able to figure out how to move a house in no short, short order. Now, where did the Maynard house go to? It ain't there now. Um, a relative uh, married into the Hapgood fa family. They married Lewis Hapgood. Um, did they look around and say, hey, cousin, cousin Amory, what are you doing with your house? We'd love to have it. Roll it across the street. <laughs> now, I can't say for sure that that's what happened here, but it's a beautiful home, um, and they the other home disappeared. So did they take this house and move it to a, a house, an area that had a smaller house and just go with that? You're saying the Alden house is the, could be the answer. I'm saying that the Alden house um, could be the Amory Maynard house. Um, and I can't find anybody who is telling me, no, it can't be, <laughs> which makes me feel good. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I don't know. It's just, there's a couple of mysteries here. The uh, Massachusetts Historical Society came down and they said, we can't make any sense of this house. That's basically what they said. Uriah Ephraim Maynard House, also the Curtis House. Built around 1800 by either Uriah or Ephraim Maynard, cousins of Amory. It has seen extensive renovation, which confuses the question of its origins. All of the houses like down there are like that. It's been owned by the descendants of John Curtis, the superintendent of the Rice and Hutchins Shoe Factories for most of the 20th centuries and their properties were orchards for most of that time. During the war, German prisoners of war from Fort Demons were used during the apple harvests. How's that, huh? A little factoid. So here's a, uh, a view of the house from the water. Obviously now there's too many houses in between on Paquin Drive, but Here's the house as it appears now. And this, this is uh, pictures that we got of the Curtis family in the 40s. So, um, okay, the boathouse. Talk about some deeds. Susie Morse, widow of Harold Morse, sells one and a half acre portion of the 11 acre plot her husband purchased from Thomas Hurley to St. Mark's School for a boathouse for consideration paid on Reservoir Street, said this in the, in the deed, formerly known as the road from Marlboro to the village of Rock Bottom. It says that on the deed. Fast forward 2003, so this was in 1928, okay, so it's it was, they owned it that long, 1928. 2003, St. Mark sells the land and the boathouse for $400,000. So 
For consideration paid means they were given the land and they sold it for 400 grand. Not bad. Now, I'm thinking, well, maybe the city didn't know they got it for nothing, you know? Maybe they, uh, maybe they didn't know. So here's the roads to Rock Bottom. You either went across Reservoir uh, and then crossed over Route 62. Or you came down Hosmer Street, you could have taken Causeway over and gone this way. For a while, there wasn't a road here, so that you would have had to go that way. When they put the road in, sometime in the 19th century, uh, now you would go straight across to Rock Bottom. Now the question is, did this have anything to do with Maynard's decision to build a sawmill? when they build a cotton mill down there. So here is the road to Rock Bottom. And this is the St. Mark's Boathouse. I'm not sure when this picture was taken. My guess was in the 40s. That's my guess. But uh, great photo. Here's the boathouse as it's seen today. Here's the Fletcher Hickson boat launch. And I said to myself, who the heck is Fletcher Hickson? <laughs> well, he was one of the commissioners. Of course, you would know that, and I would not. Um, and uh, he was a longtime commissioner, I guess. And uh, Mr. Duran has all kinds of information on what the commissioners did, and uh, you know, even going way back. So I'm excited to see some of that stuff. Red Spring Road. The Morse family purchased all the property along Red Spring Road between 1910 and 1913. Who was Harold Morse? Harold Morse was one of the early mayors of Marlboro. Uh, most, um, most importantly known for his uh, efforts to get the uh, and get a large sum of money from Carnegie for the building of the library. Okay, so he chased after him. He actually never met Carnegie, but Carnegie heard that he had kept coming and he was impressed by that. So he says, all right, you can have the money. So uh, he gave $30,000 and then people in town kicked in some money. Um, he was also the head of the enterprise so he was very influential. So, 1910, he buys a plot from Elmer Howe, another from Irving Howe, 1911 from another plot from Elmer Howe, 1911 from Thomas Hurley. Now I'm curious about this, of course, I made up a story in my head. 1913 from Theodore Temple. I know that Theodore Temple was related to the Howes. Um, probably his mother was a how, I guess. All for one dollar in various considerations. Not a bad haul. He owned all of Red Spring, including uh, the new properties that they uh, later turned around and sold um, up on Stephen Street for the small development up there, Worcester Road or whatever that is. Um, so they made out. Now, I'm going to talk about some of the historic homes. In the 1903 um, document, you see a bunch of, dotted, a bunch of dots where um, obviously cottages were located. Okay? I think there were about six of them. Many of these that I'm going to point out, I believe, were on the map at that time. Um, but I, I don't know. It just appears because of how they look that they, that they are that way. Notice that there's two windows, a door, very boxy type of situation, and a wraparound uh, porch. This house I'm very familiar with. Uh, my sister's family owns it, the Maslowskis. They were des descended from the Burks. Um, 
So uh, the Burks have owned it for a very long time. And uh, a beautiful little summer of cottages. And so you can see there are others very much like it. All right, wraparound porch, small boxy central. Here's one, I really like this one, the lookout house up on the hill. Um, this must be very old as well. Now there are two that acted as clubhouses, maybe others as well. One was the Quinnabog Club. Okay, um, so the Quinnabog Club was uh, right down by the Maslowski home. Um, I believe it's now owned by the Shorts. Um, so, so this has a uh, kind of a storied history. Um, in my uh, brother-in-law's uh, part of the uh, memorabilia at the cottage, they have this presentation to T. Henry Burke, which was his grandfather. It says Quinnabog Club. You can see the Q up here, and all the members of the club. Now I had Dick Cochran look these up for me, and and he discovered that these were shoemakers, almost all of them, uh, a few clerks, um, but they didn't seem to be the uh, the rich of town. They were kind of like uh, probably middle class, maybe even lower middle class. Okay, many of them Irish, uh, but there's a Brigham in there. So um, it's a house with a history. Also, the Nebaganga Club, very similar. OK, so this is how it appeared, probably back in the 40s, I would think. Here's a, this is from 1911, this particular photo. The other photo that we had of the Quinnabog Club, that was 1907. We actually saw a, um, an article in the Enterprise that said where you could find the photo in 1907. Uh, this has an age of 1911. Not very clear, obviously, but... Paul, oh, where did that name come from, Nipaganga? You know, they're thought to be Indian names, but... I don't know. Sounds Indian to me, doesn't it? <laughs> I could probably make up a, a dozen such names and give them meaning. Here's the way it appears today. Municipal beaches, World War II Memorial, first rented by the city in 1946 and named Moriarty's Beach. I would like to know why. Moriarty was a police officer. Why him? Why did he get the benefit? If anybody knows, I'm all ears. Informally, it was also named Savage's Beach, presumably after the Indians, or perhaps the way that you had to um, kind of scramble over the dam to get to the beach. It was very rough. In 1953, the city purchased the beach from the American Woolen Company for $1,000 and improved it. Renamed it World War II Memorial Beach. 13 acres there includes the Boston Dam between the beach and the parking lot. So you can tell I was there on a not summer's day. <laughs> Centennial Beach, established in 1964 when Hudson purchased two parcels of land, one from A.J. Lane for considerations <laughs> and one from Bonazzoli and Sons by eminent domain for 20000 Mr. Bonazzoli was in it for the money, obviously. 1966 was the centennial anniversary of Hudson, hence the name. Okay, so more modest, but uh, serviceable. Now we're going to talk about the neighborhoods. I think I'm right on schedule here. Red Spring Road, purchased by Walter Morse, 1910 to 1913. Okay. Cunningham Farm, there was a number of houses built on the property 
Uh, so that actually constitutes a little development of its own. I think the houses began in the 20s, I, I put down, Buck, is that correct? They started to build them? Definitely, uh, after 1935. 1935. Indian Lake Shores, built by resort properties, developed 1943. All right, so 1943 was when they put in the plot plan. But they didn't really start selling them until till the 50s. All right, so that's Lakeshore Drive. Um, Bruce Road, Daniels. Daniels came later. Some of these did come later. Thank you for the correction. And here is um, the plot plan. Uh, section C, did we say? Um, oh, the, uh, the, I got this information from Joe, uh, Joe Zingas. Um, I think this was plot C. Section C. Huh? I understand Section C that will include Elizabeth Road. Um, way on the right hand corner. Yeah, Elizabeth is on this is on this map. Yeah. Here's uh, one of the beaches. Another one of the beaches. And this is the water supply. Um, that is located on Bruce Road. Okay, uh, we actually have some pictures of the city putting this in, um, but I wasn't able to get it from the DPW in time. But uh, it was put in, I believe, in the 40s. Sound right? Yep. Rustic Park down here on Bolton Street, part of the lake, Blazewood Avenue. Okay, small, I don't know, maybe there's eight to ten houses there. Developed by John Blaze, 1947. Westview Lake Shores, Marlboro and Hudson by Harold Drugan and others, started in 1950. One of the interesting things here is that Cullinane Drive was called for a short period of time Lake Space Shore Drive, and I think that the I think that the male people had a problem with that. Oh. But he developed both this area and the Lakeshore Drive section of Hudson, inside Causeway Street. I think uh, Hill Street is it Hill Street or something else is in there. So here's one of the uh, here's one of the beaches along uh, Westview Lake Shores. There's a few of them here. Uh, neighborhood beaches are for benefit of the the uh, people within those areas. Um, Reservoir Estates, former property of the Curtis family, developed 1969 by Richard LeDuc, Paquin Drive. Okay, so that's one of the later ones. These are all kind of by the age. Miles Standish Estates. Uh, I get, I have a commentary on this one. This really isn't that close um, to, the, uh, to the water. Uh, not too far, it's kind of across the way. On land owned by the Standish family. So, here's my commentary. In 1620, Miles Standish came with others and established a small community on American Indian land. In 1960, Miles Standish created a small community in the heart of the praying Indian plantation of Marlboro. The land he developed was on Spoon Hill Avenue. 1960. 1620, the original Miles Standish. 1960, the new Miles Standish. And he lived in the Lewis Hapgood house for a time and developed Miles Standish Estate. I thought Miles Standish Road was named after the first guy. It was probably named after the second guy. He was a very important financier at Marlboro. He was a bit of a, a land, uh, 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 what do you call him? Yes, there you go. OK, so the land he developed was on Spoon Hill Ave, formerly called Spoon Hunt Road. John Bigelow believed it was named after the important Indian Espoonant family. 
Uh, and I could probably talk for an hour about the Spoonit family. They were very important. Um, and what do you know? Spoon Hill, Spoon Hunt. Because of its proximity to Hosmer Street, it's possible the, the, that Whips of Nicky was in that neighborhood. Okay, so here's, you know, um, part of the Miles Standish. Notice that there's a hill here. Um, Frank Alden, who lives in this house, 719, said that this hill uh, was above these houses in 1960. Okay, so they had to move all this dirt to make this house. Water's Edge, the Morris family. So the Morris family took a piece of their property above Red Spring Road and um, Worcester Road is the one that goes around, Worcester Drive. So there's a number of houses here, so they developed that property. Ford Meadows Ski Club, probably the, one of the most important um, recreational clubs ever to be in Marlboro. 1954, small group teams began water skiing on the lake. 56, a club was formed, dues collected, officers elected, all the officers were teens. In 1959, the club incorporated. Because of that, they had to get adult officers. And they began to sponsor large-scale ski shows at Fort Meadow and other lakes in the region. Boston newspapers were used to help sponsor and publish the shows. Dick Curtis became president, and the Curtis boat launch was used to store equipment and provide a base of operations. So here's a ski club. Sorry, I'm not going to give you time to name everybody. Here's where the boat launch was. Um, New England water ski, open water ski. Um, don't see a date on this, but it was the late 50s at Memorial Beach. Notice this thing here. Largest active water ski club in America. <laughs> in Marlboro. Can you imagine? Huh? I just... Amazing. So, it says here, founded in 1954, that's when they did start. And the, the uh, board of directors, Curtis, And here's the boosters, so the people that were funding it. And I have a bunch of these pictures that Bill gave me. <laughs> Obviously, a uh, Mexican theme that year. <laughs> Here's some really old boat pictures that they had. They had a, a boat parade, and they recreated the parade, I believe, in the uh, uh, more recently. A lot of fun to be had here. In the late 60s, interest began to decline as the founding group aged out and began having families. The Curtis family decided to relocate, and the developer built homes on Packwood Drive and the former Curtis family property and location of the ski club boat launch. Uh, other locations for the home base were dry, but uh, were unsatisfactory. So over time, the club activities were curtailed, and it's no longer the largest in America. <laughs> Invasive species, everybody knows about. They're still around. If you go around the beach, there's pockets of them everywhere. Here's... Um, Billy Dunbar with a uh, story some years ago on uh, the great clam inf infestation. So you can see the clams he's holding in his hand there. Asiatic clams. So occasionally one of these will come up and they have to clean it out, as you know. The end. Thank you, Thank you for coming.